what we like uh, when the hallway is a bit dark is uh, we, we get a sense of, uh, of hope uh, down the end of the hallway there because there's light coming from that end, which I, I like. Because uh, I do think that in a way these tunnels are the dark passageways of human experience. Yes, I could tell you some stories. The question is, can they be verified? It's fun to see the reaction of people seeing the building for the first time because it is a terribly evocative building and, and a building that just uh, feeds your imagination and makes you want to respond to it in, in creative or art artistic ways. When we arrived, there was no one here. Andy was supposed to meet us, but we had no idea where he was. And the door was open that one creepy inch. Didn't turn on any lights and we found ways into the basement. Then you see your room and you're like, oh, this must be the room where this and this and this happened. And you get to sort of let your imagination go crazy. And I loved it. I thought it was great. And I'm walking through this incredible building and feeling these feelings. It's like I've, I've called it ghosts before. And I know it's not ghosts, but it's like everywhere you look, there's, there's these stories that are just like coming at you. And as I drove up the long driveway, I was saying, so this is the mental hospital. And then touring through it, I couldn't get over uh, all of the abandonment and uh, darkness I felt about the room. This place may remain vacant until, uh, until it's demolished for, for the historic sense and, and purpose of this, I hope that doesn't happen. But it's also an extremely expensive, expensive building to maintain. A building at a transitional period in its life, in, in decline or decay, seems to exude the stories or give up the stories that are uh, embedded in it. Um, Site-specific theater works with the history, the archived history and the legend uh, legends and myths and oral history that comes out of these particular sites. This door is interesting because you've got this peephole that was used to check uh, the well-being of the patient. All these marks tell a story, really. Um, even the cracks or the way the paint peels um, can be metaphors for aging and how time has changed this space and how our, our relationship to public health care has changed and changing attitudes towards the mentally ill. They had collected things for, for the uh, book that they did on the, on the history of the mental hospital. Right. The so uh, some of they selected some of the documents were probably more interesting. Mentally ill persons at one time were thought to possess evil spirits and, and demons in the past 20 years or so, progress has been made in the treatment of emotionally ill. First came insulin electroshock, dramatic rapid methods of bringing depressed or insane patients to a point where they can be helped by trained psychiatric doctors and nurses. I think society didn't, was very afraid of emotional disorder. They didn't know what it meant. Were they obsessed with something? Was there some evil spirit making them do this? And I think in the 1930s, and 40s, a lot, of us, a lot of society felt that way about emotionally disturbed people. They're, they were very afraid of them. And the other thing was to put them out of sight, out of mind. And quite often you would find psychiatric hospitals outside of uh, small towns, much like Weyburn was. That 1921 when it was built.
What stays in my mind mostly is uh, driving around in, in my father's old McLaughlin Buick and when the building was finished. And of course there was no trees, there was nothing around it, you know, except the road. And I can remember the patients out uh, walking around and uh, one of them would come up to the car and, and talk to us. And, and I can remember that. that that was quite vivid. I think probably I was a little bit nervous, you know, because at that time you, you, the mentally ill were not accepted the way they were. They are now. Saskatchewan Hospital, then called the Mental Hospital, was uh, one of the few places uh, veterans found work. So I came to work in uh, Mental Hospital in Weyburn. I, I was very apprehensive. I uh, uh, hadn't uh, actually been in this building before. And uh, I walked around, it, it's uh, over a mile around it, and uh, people were putting their heads through the window, and uh, some of the kids were screaming, and I thought, well, I don't know if I'm gonna like this. My, my dad died about three years later, my mother said she was getting married. I couldn't figure out who could she be marrying. There was just this old carpenter guy coming around once in a while. She says, well, that's the guy. He said, these kids have got to go. She said, either, either they go or he goes. So my one sister went and lived with her grandmother, and uh, then it was about a week later they said that I'm, I'm going to, into the Wayburn area with, with some boys with, on a, with a farm and horses and stuff like that. And we, so my grandmother brought me out here July the 5th, 1944, and it was Wednesday and it was raining out. Well, he came back a year later and said hello again, you know. We actually admitted children here who ended, and there, were, there are um, some historical information that some children stayed here for 20, 30 years. My first memory is really just coming in and, and wondering why the patients weren't wearing clothes and why there were so many people all in one place. Well, I came in 1964, and uh, of course that was the year I graduated from high school, and I, I was quite interested in this psychiatric nursing. I thought, oh, wow, I mean, this is, this is really something, and of course I was going to help all these people, so off I came here to Weyburn. And, and I always said, if there was, if I had a means to leave after the first day that I went on to a unit, I probably would have left. I just feel so trapped. I was first really scared of the environment, of, like a lot of the other performers and the other artists. I couldn't be in here by myself. Um, but now it's... I've settled into it the way a nurse my age back in the day might have gotten used to it. Well, you entered the building in a beautiful marble staircase, and it had brass railings. And so your perception when you first enter the building is a sterile, and you can even smell how sterile the, the facility was. And then you would go down the corridors to enter into the lock units, many, many lock units at that time. And the closer you got, the more you might smell and uh, have a sense that uh, there's something on the other side of those locked doors. And when you would go through those locked doors, uh, depending on which, whether you're on some of the psychogeriatric units, there would be a real smell of urine, a real smell of feces. And there's a smell of a thousand different lives in this place. That's the one thing I've noticed. It's, it's not just a stale building. You can smell that things have happened in here. The first unit that I worked on was in the basement. And to get to the unit that I worked on, I had to walk through a unit where the very severely mentally handicapped people lived. And, uh, and of course, on that unit, I mean, they were all males, and half of them were naked, and they were lying around the floor, and I mean, there was urine and whatever else around, and, and I was carrying this big key and had to put it into the door to get to the unit on the other side. And I mean, to get through that unit was just like, am I going to get through alive? Because, you know, you'd look around, there are men following you, men with no clothes on. <laughs> and 
So it, it, was, it was pretty traumatic. I don't really remember coming into the building, but I guess I got in there, and, and I put, it was put on, I thought it was 4B or something like that for newcomers, eh? And then all there was was spittoons on the floor and tobacco butts just laying all over, and then the, and I was wondering, what the heck am I doing here? There's no kids here or nothing like that. This is, this. So this year one guy came up to me with had a white coat on. He says, uh, uh, you have to do what we tell you to do from now on. Uh, you're, we're, we're like your parents. You're, this is your home. So what, you do what we say and everything will be fine. Uh, this uh, was uh, also a shelter for the underprivileged and the unwanted, uh, because it, it's a government institution, eh? So uh, they had no other place to go, so they uh, came here. Yeah, this here was this was the dormitory. Yeah, you guys can film in here. If you like. Yeah, and it's still very similar. It's nice and warm in here too. Mm. <laughs> and my bed, my bed was right here. This was where my bed was. First got here within five days. That was when they put you in. It seemed like it was a hospital ward area, but anyway, you're, you're sort of in bed. Then all of a sudden, then you started, some of them, this, then these guys just started running their hands over you under the cover. What the heck's going on here? And I knew then the perverts were all, <laughs> I realized the place was just loaded down with pedophiles, but they had no name for them. I just knew that I never had anybody bothering me before. But, and then uh, that's, so, uh, I, didn't, I didn't know anything about, about oral sex and all that, but I sure had enough of that, eh? I'd, uh, I'd say I uh, had oral sex at least three or four times a week, and that's for the whole time, eh? What's a 10-year-old going to do to somebody that's 200 pounds and you can't do nothing? This is my nightmare. I am covered with hands. They take hold of different parts of my body, staking out their territory. I was amazed and became educated in how the mentally ill were labeled, stigmatized by being labeled with derogatory names. Imbeciles! When a new patient was admitted, they would uh, have a panel discussion, decide what unit he should go on. So the poor guy was sitting in the center and the uh, 12 psychiatrists around. So one psychiatrist say, oh, I think he, 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 I can't get anything out of him. He must be an idiot. Another psychiatrist say, no, I, I heard him. He said two or three sentences and he made some sense. Oh, they all agreed he must be a moron. Morons! There was one time there was about 10 or 12 I don't know if they were doctors or who, who they were, and uh, they're t reading off all this year's stuff, and none of it made any sense. They, to me, said that I played with the, I played with dolls and or whatever. Eh? But on our block, all there was was girls. If I was to flick a switch seven times, the next number I would have to flick it is 21 times, and then the next number after that is 101. I have no idea how I created this in my head. I have obsessive compulsive disorder and I suffer from panic attacks. Most of my artwork deals with issues of mental illness. And there was one individual I remember that uh, took three steps forward and then forward backward and couldn't make it to lunch, breakfast or supper. But in order to have a proper connection, one needs to introduce himself. So let me introduce myself, all right? I will introduce myself. Now, I am Dr. Disappointment, hello everyone. We also had um, a staff member, a very bright young uh, PhD. Sometimes I'd go into his office and uh, I would go leave his office and he'd pull a handkerchief out and he'd wipe the chair I was sitting on and then he'd wipe the doorknob by putting my hand on. And uh, I mean, this man had a wife and kid and actually ended up being in a psych hospital himself as a client. You know, I have always maintained that psychiatric nursing is an art loosely related to the actor's art. The warmth, the spontaneity, the humanity, and the intuition are really 
carefully calculated reactions based on a wide knowledge of mental illness and the needs of individual patients. Acting is very much like that. It relates quite well to maybe some of the people that were in this space that never quite knew who they were or what they were or what they were doing. They're getting a whole bunch of artists together, artists from all over the board, like theater, music, visual arts, all that, and really putting them together to be able to, to talk about this issue, talk about the, the hospital and the, the whole idea of madness. A lot of people see art as being closely related to it just because of the fact that artists are, are, have always been thought of as being outside of the norm. There's that guy that did all the murals and they say that possibly he was put in just because he wouldn't stop painting. And that's pretty bad. I'm, I know a lot of people that would probably be <laughs> put in this place if, uh, if that was the reason. Well, I think we are making a big statement about the thin line between the patients and the workers and how it was basically just this label that you are insane and you work here so you have to be sane. Where a lot of the stories show differently. Uh, we'd hear people from uptown, you know, businessmen, they said, well, you guys working up at the mental hospital, uh, the only way we can tell the difference between you and the uh, patients, uh, you're carrying keys, you know. Because women were so housebound, horse and carriage being the main source of transportation, men did most of the communicating on behalf of the family. So a man could go to town to pick up the mail and supplies, and the next thing his wife knew, she was being shipped off to Weyburn. There were people who were admitted here that actually weren't psychotic, that might have had some difficulty with their family or difficulty with society, but um, somebody would swear a commitment against with a judge and that individual would be admitted. And then they would get institutionalized and they would stay for a long time. Well, it, well, it really was a catch-all place because, uh, you know, over the years, you not only had people with mental illness, like depressions and schizophrenia, but the mentally handicapped, we, the mentally handicapped came here. Alcoholics were sent here. Epileptics, people with epilepsy, but really didn't have a whole lot of other problems, they were sent here. I know she's epileptic. I just thought if I tied her down, maybe she'd try and hold it in for once. I mean, why do we even have these anyway? <laughs> we're trying to evoke a sense of the young psychiatric nursing staff who were working here primarily between the 20s to the late 40s. Before the advent of tranquilizers and drugs. So I'm, uh, I'm kind of looking at this space here, wondering how we evoke the sense of their job routine, which was extremely busy. Uh, in those days, the hospital was overcrowded with patients. So the nurses were constantly having to deal with more and more and more demands on their time. Uh, it was so crowded that uh, we had to set up beds in the dining rooms, in the dining areas. And perhaps we could put about 100 beds in each dining room. In, in the dormitories, uh, it was so crowded that we couldn't walk between the beds, so we had to walk on top of the beds and we'd go from one bed to another to wake the patients in the morning. After Kathleen told me that story about when they uh, allowed the patients out into the grounds, that one of the first thing they did was make some little shelters for themselves, um, I started thinking, yeah, I'm sure they would if, if there was so many people in here with so much constant stimulation. I'm enjoying uh, making by hand all the ribs of this, this thing. And so in addition to a hut, it's like an upturned boat and it speaks about the journey that um, these individuals, whoever they were in this institution, were on. And, you know, I mean, we're all here many, many years later trying to imagine what their experience was. We can read about it, we can hear about it, but we can never be inside their souls and their hearts 
as they lived out this experience? I, I would say maybe the better ones, the ones that were allowed outside, they'd go out in the trees and they'd cut down branches and they'd make these type of shelters and they would uh, spend most of the day there. And, and they were uh, kind of uh, what they called the outside free living. Nurses and attendants are to remain in their wards unless and when and if their duties require them to leave their ward, and then they must have the consent of their supervisor. Shout, bedtime gentlemen, two nurses stand at one door and two at the other door. Make sure that the gentlemen take off their dirty clothes and put on a nightshirt before going to bed. This could be a time of fist fights and hair pulling. More sedatives by needle. I mean, it's like the color scheme. As soon as you take these colors and you do some test to figure out, okay, if you put someone in this kind of room, that'll make them calmer, or you know, all the ideas that sort of go into that kind of color theory. And yet, as you make it an institution, then all of a sudden everyone hates these colors, and the colors sort of, um, you've instantly kind of changed that feeling of, uh, of sort of serenity or whatever that color was supposed to do, and now you've made it this kind of institution. So the color is sort of um, a great kind of example of the way, um, the way that idea of having an institution devoted to helping people, and yet at the same time, as soon as it gets to this scale with all of these sort of problems about um, people and about running it and about how many people are here and the sort of individuality of all the problems, all of a sudden you run into you know, um, how, how crazy the, uh, the institution sort of idea is. The whole thing was control. It was amazing. It was run under a military uh, system where every, uh, it was a place for everybody and everybody in its place. There was no, hardly any bickering. You knew exactly where you fit in the, in the system. So therefore, you didn't step out of line. If you did, you were controlled, which all people want to be controlled. The nurses were immaculately in, dressed in, in uniforms that were all starched, the bibs. I don't know if you remember the bibs with their hats. There's tremendous uh, cadre of professionalism that doesn't exist anymore in the healthcare system. There are some cultural things uh, that I actually agreed with. When, when the head nurse came in, I stood up. It was quite regimented because they were trying to maintain some kind of order out of chaos. Making sure that their physical needs were met were very important. And it wasn't that easy to do that because they had to truck all the food way down from the kitchen down to A floor. And, and a lot of people needed to be fed and their beds had to be changed. Every now and again there'd be an outbreak of dysentery and so you know you knew how to do that. But you didn't know how to really be helpful to individual pay people. You can't write to anybody because uh, all your mail is intercepted, eh? Coming and going. You know, you can't use telephones, or you're not allowed to, eh? Employees must not correspond with friends or relatives of patients. They must refer all letters or inquiries to the superintendent. That superintendent was a psychiatrist. That individual was your chief executive officer. That individual had a tremendous amount of power. Maybe it's a little bit along the lines that um, some of the uh, supervisors here in the older days, like before the 50s, they used to relish their power. A lot of the, the mechanisms in place were about shame and fear, making you fearful that you'd lose your job and making you feel ashamed of not being able to cut the mustard. She's afraid of them, so that really ties in with shame and fear. She's ashamed of herself and she's afraid of patients. And I admit, there is a feeling in some parts of the institution that they should be doing something for their keep. But they mainly did repair watches for the staff, eh? So the patients did do a fair shake of the work, didn't they? Oh yeah, the staff didn't do much. I figured, why should I be making all these beds for these people? 
because they're, they're supposed to be doing it. I didn't have to do it, because uh, they didn't want to, but I, I just felt that I need, I got to keep moving, eh? Because otherwise you start losing your mind or something, I guess. You know, there was the laundry and the farm and the people paid, worked in the diet office and they worked helping the, with the uh, cafeteria and they, had, all, they all had jobs sort of thing. They had a sense of belonging and this, this was their home. And I think that while they had animals, they had a dairy farm out there and so of course you had a milk supply, you had an egg supply, you had, you had the gardens that supplied food for the facility here. I think there was a little bit of politics to have these works, work gangs because then it kind of, it served the purpose of the facility. The only problem is some got good at their job. I know somebody was out at the, you know, they had 500 pigs and chick and they got good at it out there. Well, they're a little reluctant to discharge him, you know. For me, it's a lot about um, finding out, the experience of finding out those stories that, um, that were hidden away, those, those really, um, really excellently human um, stories about people falling in love, you know, sort of in the face of the, of the institution or, or, you know, how, the, how an institution, you know, tends to try to partition people away and move people into their little compartments and how people just refuse to do that, you know, even unconsciously. And, and so they start to break those rules and move across and, and start to relate and be social because we're really social. We used to holler to the windows over to the girls' residence and they would holler back and, uh, uh, and sometimes they would uh, creep out on the, uh, on the edge of the building, which was kind of scary, so uh, I wouldn't do it myself. But, uh, you know, they say uh, love casts out all fear, and uh, I guess they had no fears. There was dance duty where we, the patients had their own dance, and we had to take part in the dance with them. We socialized, we went, we'd go out there, they'd have dances in the hall, and we people would go out there. We'd go out and visit the patients. So there's a lot of camaraderie between the city and the hospital. I think it was more that you made your own fun, just like a, find ways to uh, deal with all of the madness and, and uh, Horrendous, it was horrendous, some of the things that you had to deal with because there wasn't very much to work with. I hated holidays and weekends. They were for no value whatsoever. Eh? And you, you couldn't go to the shows. There's no newspapers, there's no radio, there's nothing, eh? Well, going, going to school, uh, well, it was the only enjoyable thing that I really had here, eh? I got to remember there was only about 15 kids all all totally. Eh? There wasn't there wasn't very many that went to school because uh, they didn't know what was going on. As a rule, even off my ward, there was hardly anybody. Eh? I remember uh, people taking someone who I didn't know to call mentally ill, but who was probably mentally ill, and. Uh, putting him in a car and people holding him in the car to take him to Weyburn. Jaw, where to pick up this fella you, from the, the cells at the police station. And somehow he broke the toilet bowl, you know, the porcelain, and he just stood there like that, you know, come and get me. And uh, the police were just scared to go down there. You've got the mattress and you're, you're just marching behind it, you know, right. one arm, this one guy, this, and once you're right on top, and then we just, right. wow. just grab his arm. Grab his arm and then try and get him out, kick his feet on him, under him, you know. So, you know, we downed him and, uh, and he wasn't even that big, you know, he was about 35. You know, of course we handcuffed him, you know, belt. But I remember that time, you know, was a case where we could have, could have got hurt, you know.
you were told that you must never retaliate no matter whatever a patient did, ever, because if you did, you would be fired on the spot. He wanted me to go in the day room, and I didn't want to go in the day room. I just wanted to be out walking the, up and down the hallway by myself. And uh, so he, he knocked me down, he kicked me in the back and all that. The doctor was going through, and I told him this guy was beat me up, and he looked at my back. And uh, he, he almost got fired, eh? But after that, he never bothered me again. This was a time before tranquilizers came into assistance. So we had to use uh, manual restraint and forcibly restrain these people. And uh, we used uh, a drug called epimorphine, and uh, that caused the peristalsis in reverse. They got very sick and they would vomit. And this was a form of uh, punishment. When you're out on the yard, you're t like at recess, you, you go to the ball diamond. You don't go beyond the ball diamond, but I like to s see what's beyond, if, just normally. So I went up in the tree and I was looking at bird egg, some robin's eggs, eh? And the teacher, I don't know why she was this mean. She had a cork leg, eh? And she always walked like this around it. And, and so, uh, I don't know why she was mean. She called the administration, said I went across the road and I'm not supposed to go across the road. And so they, that's when they put me down in 2A, the snake pit, for two months, eh? There was no, absolutely nobody to talk to. And the, the patients just pooed on the floor, peed on the floor, and, and they had this here guy, Max Burnett, He'd come from floor to floor and clean up the mess because nobody wanted to clean that mess up. And he didn't seem to, and he always just sang that, that uh, jingle, eh? Chana, chana, chana dee. Oh, chana, chana, chana dee. You need earplugs. It was just all he said, eh? You get all this here smells coming from the floor, just like being uh, on, a, on a farm, staying in a pen that has never been cleaned out, eh? So I'm latexing over everything that's here. And what will happen is after I'm finished and I pull it off, whatever loose will come off with the latex and it will be embedded in the latex. I'm interested in the idea of public and private space and what goes on behind closed doors and where that transition takes place. Um, and and there, there are obvious uh, boundaries within an institution because we put up walls and we put up barriers and we put up bars to contain um, patients or clients, whatever we're calling them these days. The wall is pretty much a metaphor for the, um, the hospital itself, um, kind of this um, separation, separation that happens between different people within society and uh, kind of the taking away of people from society and put into an institution. We did have rooms in the basement where if people were aggressive, that uh, they would go in and uh, there was a sliding glass so the staff could look through and see the clients just much like you see in Alcatraz. I can handle it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> no, but, but I have some ideas too. Good. So we'll discuss. It's not so much a question of endurance and whether you can handle it, it's also a question of whether it's right for that. Because looking on that text, I wonder if maybe there's better places. Yeah. So, because there's another, there's another refractory room open that they cleared out that's really pretty eerie. And then I went uh, down the basement where we are now and uh, uh, was assigned to the what they call the refractory ward. And uh, there were 10 people in side rooms. They were all locked up and they were the more violent ones. My first encounter was with a uh, actually was a professional Italian boxer. And when we opened the door, he jumped on my partner and uh, breakfast flew all over the place. And we had uh, quite a time to uh, get uh, his hands loosened from my partner's neck. One has to be very quick if there was an upset individual in the room, as you could be the recipient of a plate of food plus a cup of hot coffee. They press these in, press these in, so then they come flying through here. I went to the door. She didn't see who it was. She was in. All she had was a little peephole. 
I opened the door to give her some food, and uh, instead of she knocked the tray out of my hand and pulled me across the floor with by my hair, and then she put me down. <gasps> oh, Chu, I'm so sorry. <gasps> I'm so sorry. And forever, for for months and months and months and months, years even, she would remember that, and and uh, she said I thought it was the other lady. She said, she'd been treating me so bad, she said, I thought she, it was she. I was going to show her who was boss. <laughs> After a bit, not being here all that long, you gradually develop relationships with patients and it wasn't so frightening. You get attached to the people you're working with. And um, some uh, experiences are very heartwarming and uh, uh, they could tell us stories whereby uh, uh, we uh, were touched uh, by their stories, by their, uh, why they're here and uh, what they're doing here, how roughly they were treated back home and so on. And we became quite attached uh, to these people. One of the staff became so attached that he eloped with one of the patients, one of the girls, and we didn't see him. He didn't come back for his paycheck. No. <laughs> Church was like to be a fairly solemn event in my way of looking at things. So of course I was put on church duty and down I went with about a group of patients. On the way in, one of the ladies who was quite uninhibited said, how the hell are you, Reverend? Shook his hand and sat down. Shortly following that, one of the other epileptics had a severe seizure and fell to the floor. And somebody just went and got her and, and attended her, and away she went for a bit, then she came back and sat down. And of course, one of the pa patients was playing the organ, you know, in a sort of a way. There was a fellow here, and he always wore a Boy Scout outfit at all times. And he marched into the church, he had been out in the hall, and he marched into the front of the church with a paper bag over his head, and just at that point of the end of the onward Christian soldiers, he whipped off the paper bag and saluted the minister. And the minister said, thank you, Winston. <laughs> And I'm trying desperately hard not to laugh because, I mean, there was nothing else to be done. Psychiatric nursing became a separate and registered profession in Saskatchewan. The trainees gradually discovered hope and motivation and a whole range of ideas about relating to the mentally ill. So they removed psychiatric nursing from the stigma of custodial care or the role of the prison guard and pushed it to a new level. We were given direction, but not a lot, because there were so many new people, and there was summer relief, and there was, you know, um, many, many things to, to deal with and cope with. But we were expected to do things that were really beyond our skill level at that time. And even though all the supervisors were very supportive and tried to, to show us how to do things, they were o over expended themselves, but they did, most of them, I would say 90% of them were very compassionate and they taught us well. One incident. The resident decided she was going to smash windows, and before we could subdue her, she had smashed three windows, cutting her wrists and bleeding severely. should do it as a nurse, setting pills beside the bed, doing um, her nightly routines, but there's actually nobody in the beds. Okay, that's great, but you know what? I, I guess what I kind of want in a way, if possible, is for you to do that in here. Is there a way, like, and what I mean by that is, this was the ECT unit, we know that for sure. Oh, And it I was see. also an insulin. Uh, place. Le uh, Leo Belanger came by the other day and he said it was ECT and insulin. So this, this room is a gold mine. There was lobotomy uh, 
and one flew with a cuckoo's nest. And uh, if you had an extremely aggressive patient, they, had, they were lobotomized, and it, it calmed them down. I think what they did is they lost a lot of their, uh, their emotions, and they lost a lot of their feelings. There was group therapy, an attempt to try to get people to talk about what their, their anger was from, or what their concerns were, or what their anxiety was based from. There was, uh, there was activity therapy. I know we had music therapy at that time, because there was a concept that music had a lot to do with trying to calm people down. There was also insulin shock therapy. There was hydrotherapy when I first came to, and that was an attempt to, to use water to calm people down. I kind of approached it addressing the hallmark approach to illness. Wishes, thoughts, and prayers. Do they actually have some sort of a healing potential? You know, I mean, cut the color and the and the images and the objects and the birdies and the kitty cats and the puppy dogs, the praying puppy dogs, sort of lends a certain cheeriness. And if I was bedridden, it would certainly make, you know, I think it would make me feel better. But if I were mad, I don't know. Uh, people that were violent, we would give them a few uh, electric shock treatments. And uh, the doctor would carry the electric box, and uh, uh, we would place the prongs on the person's temples, one on each side. And then he would say, uh, we'd say when we were ready, he'd press the button and give them a certain voltage, and it'd knock them out. And we'd use this shock treatment for maybe once a day for about nine, ten days, and this subdued them. When I first came here, the electroconvulsive therapy was straight. In other words, you tried to convince the patient to lay down. If he didn't, he ran and you went and caught the patient, and he was brought back and he received ECT cold. Uh, then it was a couple years later, of course, then it was uh, with, uh, with the anesthetic, and, and they were out when they got the treatments. Just around the corner where you are there, that's where they did shock treatments, and I can see these guys, they were just going crazy, eh? And then, then they'd be, you're next, you're next, you're next. And I feel, I don't know, it's not me, I don't want to be next. Like that when they did it, it's whatever they did, and then they'd do it again. You see the body shaking. In the spring, when they put the crop in, he's worried that he wouldn't get a crop. He'd get depressed again in the fall when it was spring and the uh, harvest time. And he'd come in for shock treatment. And he improved and he went back home but in the fall he was back again. So he was taught this over, you know, he was kind of a smart guy, and he said, well, uh, if that's all you guys are gonna do to me, I, I think I can maybe manage at home. So he, when he felt uh, his depression coming on, he would start up the tractor, he'd grab a hold of the spark plug, and he'd knock himself out, he'd fall on the ground, and then he'd get up. And, and that was it, he took shock treatment. And he'd do this a few times, so once a day, and, and you know, we never seen that guy again. I have my own opinions about the, the lack of effect of any of these treatments. I never saw them being beneficial at all. I don't know what the literature proves, but uh, with the major phenazizines, you were able to reduce the uh, psychosis and then start dealing with some of the issues. My dad told me a cute little funny thing that happened years ago when Tommy Douglas came to visit the mental hospital. There were patients working in the garden and Tommy wanted to make conversation with them, so he asked one of the men about the strawberries that were, that were growing abundantly. Tommy asked, do you put manure on the strawberries? And the patient looked rather surprised and answered, no, we put sugar on them. <laughs> then, Dr. Humphrey Osman took over the superintendency of the hospital and he walked onto the wards to make his first official rounds and the staff stood to attention as they always did and then hastened to unlock the doors for him. Please don't get up for me if you're talking to a patient, he said. Your patient is the important person in this hospital. I can unlock my own doors and practically overnight 
the ideals the staff had learned in lectures became possibilities. The hospital set about bringing itself out of the Middle Ages and into the 20th century. He was very interested in research and he also knew how to get money and convinced the politicians that this was what needed to be done. So at that time, and it did attract doctors from all over the world. You know, people from the Menninger Clinic were here and people from sociologists from other countries and doctors that were doing research. So it was a very um, promising time to work here. There's a research department in the basement when I was here that had test tubes, microscopes, just like you see in the movies. And uh, there was uh, some PhD psychologists and uh, other uh, medical individuals whose sole job was to do research. We're going to have a, a psychiatric nurse here. She's relaying a story uh, about a psychology uh, student, a nurse, who uh, took uh, some LSD from Dr. Humphrey Osman. And uh, as you, you've probably heard, uh, the staff took LSD down here so that they could have better empathy with uh, patients who have schizophrenia. After taking the drug, she sat outside in the dirt in the flower garden. She sat, letting the dirt run through her fingers. What I'm doing in this space is that I will be creating a maze of sorts, maybe giving them some sort of a, a experience, which may or may not be related to uh, the type of experience one got when they were on LSD. These twins were admitted, they were identical twins. So there was very significant people from the University of Saskatchewan, researchers came, the psychiatrist, psychologists studied these individuals. Maybe this was an opportunity of finding a commonality with schizophrenia. The one twin was on medication, the other twin was not, was on the placebo. The twin that was on medication was on a, a very high dose. We know that nowadays, a very, very high dose. That individual got into the bathtub put the plug in unsupervised and scalded himself to death, which is horrible. At the same time, his identical twin brother, uh, two wards down, was screaming and yelling. And this is documented. The drugs didn't necessarily cure the patients, but they made them more accessible, minimal, to uh, treatment. You could talk to them and they'd get into programs and you know be more active and uh, more cooperative. The pain associated with a physical illness, uh, take cancer, take any other type of disease, is tremendously horrible. But that perhaps is over after four or five years. The tremendous um, images that some of these people had that maybe answer in their skin or that their internal organs were rotting out, they had those, those horrible anxieties for years. When the major tranquilizers and the major treatment uh, medications were introduced, you could see people start to reduce some of these um, overt uh, psychotic symptoms, and it was tremendously satisfying to see that happening. One of them would bite everybody of the minute she used to just go around biting everybody. After the, the Largactyl and all of the trials and getting them on the proper doses, she, there she was sitting at the table eating with cutlery and fully dressed, it was like a miracle to me. I thought, isn't that something? It wasn't too good, uh, your relationships with the community, if, if somebody was at large in the community. But we had a, a very well-organized fan out system where if Mr. X or Miss X was missing, there are certain procedures that would go in place and uh, we would uh, be out there trying to find them. It took two months to set it up. Cause the, the girl I wanted to run away with, she was, she was in my class at school, but we were both out of school at this time because she was 16 too. And they were always wondering how, I, how anybody could get a girl from there because it was the most difficult thing to do. But if you spend months at it, you can figure it out. <laughs> and so away we went. And I always used to think to myself, it'd be sure nice if I had her holding hands. We're, we're going down the railroad tracks that aren't there anymore. And, and it was, actually it was pretty darn nice, actually. <laughs> Something you... You'd, you'd like to have happen for over a year, eh? And somebody you could actually talk to and all that, but 
she was lacking education. I knew she didn't have the social skills to function normally, but she was still my best friend anyway. So, and we went down the side road and down the railroad tracks to Wayburn. And uh, the first day, we were just out in the, out in the field. And uh, well, this year doesn't seem like a very good runaway deal, but we stayed there all day because we didn't want to be seen. And by morning, we we're part way to Regina, and we started hitchhiking. The guy gave us a ride the rest of the way, and stayed in Regina for most of the day. And then nighttime, we went to visit the, my school teacher. Oh, how did you guys get, get, be, happen, happen to be together? I said, well, we ran away. And she said, okay, uh, I'll get you some more lunch, eh, if you want. But she called the police, eh? And the cops took us downtown. Then they took us back, and then an hour later, we were locked up in rooms for three weeks. And you, you realize if you run away, <laughs> where you run to, this, they only bring you back all the time, so. When uh, Dr. Osmond came, and he uh, thought the patient shouldn't be confined, and he opened the door, and one day, and everybody, and there was 2,000 of them, and they all came streaming out, and they went all over town, and they didn't know where they were. Well, of course, the, the, the citizens in Wayburn just had, had a fit, and he said, you can't do that. So they got back all the ones that they could, and then they started putting them out in, in, in little uh, group homes. And that sort of thing, well, that was okay. A friend of mine that worked out there, I can remember talking to him on the street one day, and he says, you know what? <laughs> it's what's the count today, rather than how is everything. It's what's the count today. He was trying to get everybody out. I would think it'd be about 1964, the Department of Health under leadership of the superintendent at that time decided to initiate what was called the psychiatric reform or mental health reform in Saskatchewan. And the idea was to reduce the um, number of uh, psychiatric beds, patient, pa people in psychiatric hospitals. I don't think it was done for uh, the right reasons. I think it was done for money. It was like, very expensive to run these facilities. The concept was good, but um, the fact that they didn't put infrastructures in place to be supportive of these individuals in the community was, was not good. How's our audience this today? I have no idea. I'll be here. I'm not moving an inch now. What kind of, well, it's mainly rain. Actually, that's right. Well, yeah. Have a great show. Good show. Good job. It's really important how the public comes in and interprets this building and how to have a relationship to the past. And we celebrate the fact that the, their relationships will be multiple, they'll be plural and diverse, because uh, that, I think, is more in keeping with the way people really experience the world and the past. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Nurse Runge, thank you. And your name? Do Rita. Rita, nice to meet you. Dave. Rita. Dave. Dave, please have a seat. Uh, welcome. Welcome to the institution. Okay, good. Are you eating well? And Sleeping well, and, uh, bowels moving regularly. Yes. Generally, yes. Okay. Okay. No problem. Okay. And sir, if you could be a car part, which one? car part? Yeah, car part. any part of the car. Which part do you think? I think the engine. Engine. The engine. And why? Performance. 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 Excellent. You will be in the green group today. That's the best group for you, according to your answers, and you'll be in the green group as well. Good. So I want the audience to reconsider this building. It's a building that's vexed with a really complex and, and um, fraught history. People have very strong feelings about it, both positively and negatively.
This site installation focuses on the stigma of labeling the mentally ill. Were you aware that since about 1975, the care of the aged and the mentally ill is the new industry of Saskatchewan? The primary functions of this industry are, everyone is a potential patient, health is focused as a community-based service, so there is no concept of discharge. Patients flow in and out of the system for quick adjustments and repairs. Do you know that the mentally ill have endured in silence the stigma of labels and name calling? The Mental Hygiene Acts of Saskatchewan from 1953 through 1960 contained labels such as mental defective and mental deficiency, but in 1961 those labels were changed to mental retardation. I appreciate your attention. Your next new appointments are waiting for you in the adjacent room. We had a pleasant ride to Weyburn. Then we turned into a long driveway, and into what looked like a park. There was lots of grass and trees, people walking about, or others just sitting on benches in the sun. I was at that time about 12 years old, and I had no idea what to expect inside the building. My first impressions were disconcerting, and I stayed close to my father. Welcome to Ward B. First off, make rounds checking all side rooms. <coughs> So I brought the hut inside the institution in these walls that still echo um, the, the pain, the difficulties, the, certainly the psychic and uh, physical imbalances of people. All the stories are still in this place. So I brought it in here to speak to that uh, notion of people wanting to connect with nature, to connect with their own independence, and to kind of defy the... Uh, the idea of what an institution does to us. For some of us, it's pretty loaded, the whole situation, the whole, uh, as many people fall on one side of the fence or the other in terms of uh, their perception from, you know, the glorious institution for some and, and the incredible victimization of uh, people on the other side. It was just like the insane asylum, like where all the crazy people went and, um, you know, there were just a lot of stories and a lot of fear and um, I guess just people not really knowing what went on here, so they made up stories, yeah. Yeah, my mom and dad would always say that the Wayburns were the mental hospital is, they're taking us to Wayburn, <laughs> so. Like downstairs and seeing the rooms with the little tiny, like, hole to look in, um, it's just, it's just really overwhelming. I don't know, I found like when I started to get like stressed out by it, I just look out the window and I can imagine that a lot of people have done that in this building. A block-headed farmer from not far from here used to send away for a new male order bride every summer, which would die the following spring during childbirth. He'd bury them in summer follow and then crop over them in the fall. Finally, one of his wives survived childbirth. She was shipped off to Weyburn and never returned. It's pretty overwhelming, just driving down the driveway and you're just, I guess as a woman and thinking about the era when women were housed here, many of them inappropriately and against their will and issues of human rights for women and how far we've come. I just can't imagine being a woman who was isolated, probably battered, probably poor, coming into this setting. I dreamt that I was going through the ward on a school tour. Somehow I would always get sidetracked and left behind by my fellow students. I would try my best to convince the nurse or orderly that I was a student and not a mental patient. This would always happen at a shift change when new staff was coming on the ward. The nurse would smile at me and say, yes dear, that's fine, you'll be a good girl now and won't give us any trouble. 
Well, I would panic. She'd start crying and screaming, and the nurse would call for an orderly to come to aid her in sedating me. The orderly would come running down the hallway towards me with a syringe. I would turn. Somehow make it through the door at the end of the hallway. And every time I entered a new ward, I would run and jump over another defective. It makes you think almost like the Holocaust or something. The buildings, you know, the way Jewish people go there and, you know, it's like a warning or something. Like you feel there's almost smells in here that just, you know, just create such a sense, almost like history is in the walls or something. In fact, we've had quite a few. People that disappeared, we didn't know where they were. Maybe a day or two later, we found them hanging in the trees. I had uh, my own experience. I'd only worked here about four months, and I was uh, uh, patrolling the side rooms, and I looked in one of the side rooms, and there was a, a man hanging. He had uh, stepped on the bed to put the cord around the pipe, then around his neck, and he jumped from the bed, and uh, he was gone. When I was 12, I was getting fed up with the place, eh? Because I thought, I even got, I even got some sky, what do they call, stuff to kill flies. I got a big bowl of it, and I figured, well, this is the day I'm going to use it. And then after a while, I thought, nope, I'm not going to let them get me. Well, I used to actually come out here as, as a re little kid and have picnics with my family. Then as a teenager, this was the place to come and hang out, but it definitely wasn't a place that I wanted to stay very long when I was growing up. Patients used to come out and bury their belongings all over the place. So there was always signs everywhere saying, um, no treasure hunting. That's really hard to see. Yeah, this is exactly the place that I always thought was Hangman's Hut. This is Hangman's Hut. And as you can see, there's the beam. And there was just all kinds of stories about, well, the one that I always heard was that uh, a man hung himself here and that this place was haunted by this man who, who hung himself here. And it was just a place that we all came looking for all the time and just tried to scare the shit out of ourselves. I thought I might work, go on all the different units, and but I just couple of them I really don't want to spend a lot of time on. I don't enjoy some of the memories that get stirred up. You know, from many, I started out here, you know, many, many years, 46. And that was the time when the big crowd was here and all the, the large groups of people and, you know, few staff and custodial care. It, uh, there's some memories that are not really good. Doesn't it to it? Yeah. It's uh, it's kind of creepy, <laughs> really. It's kind of emotional actually because um, I just get this feeling that there's lot, there's other things here besides us, and uh, I can just feel it. It's like. Uh, Things haven't been released yet. There's a ghostly presence here, and, and the nurses that worked here, the frustrations they must have felt of wanting to help people and, and really, really couldn't. Um, it just evoked a, a you know, strong emotion in me, just walking into here. We nurses gather in pools of white, the ends of halls, behind desks, on top of desks. We speak in hushed whispers, in tones and languages that they don't understand. It scares them. We fill our needles, sharpen our knives, and cool our stethoscopes. My flashlight bouncing along the ceiling, and my feet speaking along the floors in smooth, measured, but sinister tones. A bed check. 
they all keep in mind that everything is done under the watchful eye of a nurse. I, I remember being on night shift and having to go down those large wards of patients sleeping with a little flashlight and just checking to make sure everyone was all right and it was so dark and frightening. And I remember as a, it being quite intimidating for me at the time. Sometimes I'm up and sometimes I'm down. Nobody, nobody knows. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. They would not have allowed a nurse to wear her skirts that short, and she just added, or her shoes to be that dirty. <laughs> that would not have been, she would have been out the door. That's true. <laughs> mm -hmm. People make a big fuss out of one of the more simpler things that happened on this floor, Kim Morgan's grass. They, they think it's a miracle that it's growing in the shape of a cross, which is just people wanting to believe. This whole room has been cast in latex and I've pulled it off and now I'm going back into it and fixing it because for me these walls carry the memories and experiences that happen within the building. It's so creepy that the windows are so high up. They don't want people to be able to see people in here. It's a way of hiding people. What you say about hiding, you know there's a metaphor in there for, for mental health. Yeah. yeah. Hiding problem? behind. Yeah. yeah. It's embarrassing. That's what the metaphor for this room in terms of the latex that's transparent yeah. and you can stretch it and it pulls and it is a metaphor for for how the stories that have changed within this wall whose memory is reliable right mm -hmm. because everybody has their own story yeah and really only the walls know um Uh, <clears throat> she asked me to take some extra shifts because of the epidemic on A level. But all, but all I do all day is change the same beds over and over and over. So I'm not really used to being covered in blood and shit all day. I mean, some of the pieces I found really offensive. Um, like, you know, people saying, oh, I feel so trapped in here, and like, or I'm um, acting like they're um, crazy, you know. I thought it was really, like a lot of the work was pretty insensitive, actually. I wasn't anticipating people being so affected by the things I've been doing and saying. A lot of people have been actually like trying to comfort my character and stuff like that, patting me on the back and telling me it's going to get better and telling me it'll be okay. So that's been kind of interesting.
Rule number one, do not break the rules. If you break the rules, you will be punished. It is my job to teach you silence, to teach you independence, to teach you survival in the world out there. Well, let's be individuals. Spread yourselves out. There's lots of room in here. Stop standing around in a circle. Come on, move, move. I'm just going to observe you while uh, we let that medication take effect. And hopefully this won't be too intrusive. Now I'm just going to come around and ask you a few questions for you, ma'am. I'm interested in knowing what your perception of color is like in this space. Does it appear keener? Uh, maybe incandescent? Or maybe as if you can see through the color? It's bright. It's bright. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a little dull in my eyes, personally, but um, you're the one on the medication. Excuse me. My secretary's just across the way, so she'll record that. Now, unfortunately, because you were late, our time for our treatment is over, so if you'll just follow me. I was worried a little bit, you know, that they might leave out the humor, but I discussed it with Andy, and he said, oh no, there'll be some of that too. Because sometimes when you worked here, that's all you had to go on was your sense of humor. Long yeah. Department store salesman in the lingerie department, like lingerie. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. No, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Miniature Buddha figurine. And uh, chocolates, yes, yes, yes. That's just the thing. Just, just the thing. Just the thing. Just the thing. Come, come with me. I think You want to know an odd response? This lady thought, I got this impression that I really was a part of this place. She somehow looked at me as what I was doing was crazy. I thought that was interesting. Just for a second, it made me feel self-conscious, like <laughs> I should actually be in here, you know? <laughs> I think the art has been therapy for me, but, you know, way back then, who knows, I could have been stuck in a place like this, so this could have been my history. Could have, I don't know. The secrets of the past have to be uh, revealed, need to be revealed. Um, it's, uh, and that's the most important thing, uh, the stories of, of um, ex-patients. Grandfather Stacy, his dying request was to get me out of here, and I, that's what started it, I think. Then I found out that I was, I was leaving. I told him, I'm going to come back and straighten this here place out if I can. The spring of 53 is when it was, I set it all up. I said, the RCMP should be here, but not in uniform. And, uh, and I, I like to be able to pick out some choices for these here people. They either quit, get fired, or they get charged. It was set up that they just come one by one into the office, but they don't know what they're being called to the office for. They just could be a change in whatever ward they're going to be on. And when they saw me and they saw the patients there and, and the three staff members, he said, then they, they knew something was up. So it seemed like I was in charge of the thing. I just said, you got three choices. And they all quit. But they would, the men would never apologize. Eh? Lots of time to think down here. 
They like to turn the tables on you. Even during the best years of your life. Blood, sweat, tears pouring out. You pour it out to them willingly. That's not enough. No satisfaction from that. No. I have to drag it out of you. Outcast. Cast down here. Sent down to the bottom, despite my years of faithful service. Did you hear that? They're back there. Scratching out a pattern on the floor. Scurrying from one wall to another. Oh, it must have been a very, very sad place and very difficult for the people to work here, but very, very sad for those who were incarcerated because it was an incarceration, I think. I'm reading a book done by a person who survived the Holocaust, and some of the noises in the rooms remind me very much of the experiences of them being taken away by train and what they had to do and all that. I think there is a small percentage of emotionally disturbed people who are chronic uh, and somewhat harmful to themselves that will require structured uh, support systems. Now, should that be in large psychiatric hospitals? No. Should that be in small places that are inside the community? I think yes, because I think then they're able to access more modern, they're able to keep in touch socially uh, and emotionally with their families. There are people that are, are only going to be able to function sort of marginally and so that they, they, need, they need a place where they're safe or, and feel safe and that they don't have that anymore. A lot of the schizophrenics are in jails, a lot of them are in, you know, ha uh, foster homes with very little support because the, there's, there's really not enough resources to go around. Time to clean up. Change of shift. Count all narcotics. Say good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Uh, we put a lot of work into something like this. It's always a little bit, a little emotional when you have to just leave it and it's done and that's over. You know, there's not too many sequels to a lot of things that people do. So there's a possibility that we'll never be back in this place. I mean, there's always, you know, I'll never revisit the script or a play, or but you'll be in the same theater again someday. But when you're doing something site specific, it's very different. I think people got to get experience from it. There's a lot of horrible things that went on here, and I think it's good for people to know about them. At a grassroots level, what people remember and what people tell about an institute like this is going to elucidate their memory, but that there's no one one central core truth about the place, you know, because one person would, would tell the truth and then another person would tell the truth, but those truths are sort of mutually exclusive, they're not reconcilable. Boy, it's been a journey. Uh, it's turned out better than I expected. I think the thing that really surprised me was really the way the community has responded because some of the things that we're doing here aren't what they expected, I don't think. I don't think anyone knew what it was going to be and, and maybe we didn't even know. In fact, I can say we didn't even know exactly what it would be. The nature of these kind of projects is they're completed by the audience. So I'm really pleased with the way the audience has completed this event and uh, made it what it is. Well, I think that that was a, a hope for a lot of the community people because when I've been talking to them, they've been saying, you know, like, oh, maybe we can do this. Yes. Year after year, this will be like a, su a summer thing. Project the Weyburn Festival. Project, yeah, hoping and hoping that we can somehow keep this place alive. Yeah. And I think it's a great idea. I don't know if it'll happen. Yeah. Maybe the community will, you know, continue on. Um, 
personally, it, it's, it's, a, it's a hard thing to think of this building being gone. Uh, I mean, it's massive. It, it's a beautiful structure, you know, to look at it from the outside. But to see the, the rough condition of it, it, it makes you feel sick. And to know it, it would just be too costly to, to try to do something with it. There are layers and experiences in this building that we want to strip away and allow the building to have one more iteration of itself before it is perhaps condemned and taken down. I just think this is an amazing project that the community has taken and I think they should be commended for, for bringing this history back to life and helping us all think about what does mental illness mean in our society today because we sure never want to go back to this. You know, this place, like many other places, there's always a stigma attached, and uh, and uh, it's not good, you know, it's not good for the general public, but uh, uh, stigma is invisible. It's something that can't be erased. You could move this entire building, and the stigma would still be here. Uh, some people don't realize that. They say, well, get rid of the mental hospital, move the patients out, and there'll be no more stigma, but you can't do that. We are such things as nightmares and dreams are made of. And our lives are set in an amalgam of space and time from their beginnings to their end. Sometimes our nightmares and dreams spread through time and remain behind us long after we are gone. This is my nightmare. I am covered with hands. They take hold of different parts of my body, staking out their territory. And I come to believe that society can accommodate itself to the most humble laborer, but that it justifiably distrusts the mad thinker. Nurse! I'm ready for my treatment.
Thank you.